So like I said, if I didn't, my name is Karen England and I am the president. I'm also the editor of the newsletter that's written by the membership. And so you, uh, if you have something that you would like to write about, uh, just send me an email and uh, we'll get you, uh, get you going. So, those of you that are new to us for the first time because of Nan, uh, would like to have you know that next month, our meeting is going to be on February 8th, and it is Nature Restoration Landscaping with Dennis Mudd. And this is a pretty exciting topic, and we're really looking forward to this. And so you can request a link if you're not a member in an email, and we will send you the link. And the link will include uh, how to become a member so that you get all the emails from us. So I hope that you'll mark your calendars and join us on February 8th. And then we've got a new uh, thing going. It's a book club. And the first one is January 25th at 6 p.m. It's on Zoom. And this is, uh, the first book is The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbach. And you have two weeks to read it if you haven't started already. And we are going to be discussing uh, books with an eye towards the horticulture in them. So, and the books are available uh, anywhere that books are sold. Uh, I'm listening to it on Audible, but, but I also have, uh, I, I also have the hardcover, but the Audible is, the Audible version is um, unabridged. So it's the whole book. Um, and then the next month, our book club is in February going to be the book that John Clements uh, recommended in his talk in December. And that is The Food Explorer by Daniel Stone. And I have uh, also got that off of uh, Amazon, but it's at Barnes and Noble and it's also on Audible. So um, you have uh, um, six weeks to read that one if you want to join in on that. And all you do to get in the club is just send an email to info at sdhort.org and um, I will uh, add you to the email list that gets the Zoom link for that meeting meets the last Monday of every month. So I hope that you will uh, think about joining. And let's see. Oh yeah, we need your help. Come on. <laughs> um, we could use your help by joining the board. In fact, there's a board meeting next Monday at 10 a.m. And if you would like to sit in and see if it's something that you would like to do, send me an email, info at sdhort.org, and you can get, to, you can sit in to see what it's all about and see if it, if it's something that you could help with. Um, and also the newsletter, uh, we were looking for columnists that are regular or one-time deals, and you can put it in the chat here tonight or email me but we do need your help. This is a volunteer group and it's the volunteers that do the work. And so we need, we need your help. And I, I know you're all uh, so capable. So just, uh, just let me know you want to help and uh, I'll put you to work. All right. Yeah, so why we're all here this evening. <laughs> I'm going to introduce Nan now to you, and then um, we're going to talk a little bit about the award part before she gives her presentation. But uh, her introduction is kind of involved.
involved in that she's done so much. So there's a lot for me to get through to, to introduce her to you tonight. Many of you know bits and pieces of her story, and but I think you, you might uh, learn something here. When I myself became a Horticultural Society board member in the summer of 2019, I was surprised to find out that Nan Sturman had not previously been honored as the San Diego Horticultural Society's Horticulturist of the Year. I imagine it is the same for many of you here this evening, and you were surprised as well, because she exudes every inch of what this honor is all about. So much so that many of us thought she was a Hoy horticulturist of the year shortened already. That she is not is being rectified this evening. And Nan, who is a garden expert, designer, author, botanist, and award-winning journalist is our horticulturist of the year for 2021. So what does it mean to be a horticulturist of the year? Every year, the board of directors of the San Diego Horticultural Society selects an important member of the local horticultural community to honor as our horticulturist of the year. The award recognizes an individual for their achievements, service, and contributions to the field of horticulture in general and especially in San Diego County. Nan, who happens to be a former SDHS, San Diego Horticultural Society, shortened, board member, is a native Californian who lives in North County. She knows and loves our area deeply and epitomizes everything wonderful about our San Diego region. So much so that she has served as an advisor to the Water Conservation Garden at Cuyamac College, San Diego Water County Water Authority, the County of San Diego, and the City of Encinitas. Nan co-founded a 5,000 square foot school garden and founded the annual Encinitas Garden Festival and Tour. But what you, she may be best known for in our community is having founded and the ongoing administration of the San Diego Gardener Group on Facebook, where more than 12,000 people discuss plants and gardening in Southern California 24-7. Since starting in the 1970s, Nan was involved in the first wave of the sustainability movement. She trained at the Integral Urban House in Berkeley, California, earned a botany degree from Duke University, a master's in biology from UC Santa Barbara, and a master's in instructional design from San Diego State University. Nan's early experiences in sustainability along with her unique ability to take complex information and create effective educational programs has, among other things, enabled her to address modern day issues. As with her most recent book, Hot Colors Dry Garden, which is about creating color-filled water-wise gardens and available for purchase from Nan's website, where you can, and I'm quoting from the website, buy the book directly from Nan to have it personally inscribed, is, uh, can be found at waterwisegardener.com. Nan has written thousands of articles, many of them where she was the garden editor of San Diego Home Garden Magazine. Additionally, she has contributed columns, especially the What to Do in the Garden, each month for the San Diego Union Tribune. She attributes her journalism career in many ways thanks to San Diego Horticultural Society. It is how Nan connected with countless horticulturists, growers, and gardeners that she has featured in her articles over the years. I, speaking for myself now, believe every person here tonight has watched some of, if not all, 46 episodes of her award-winning public TV show, A Growing Passion, that airs on KPPS TV, where she is host, co-producer, and writer. You can watch and re-watch A Growing Passion online at agrowingpassion.com. And did you know Nan leads tours to visit gardens around the world, including Europe, South Africa, Costa Rica, and the U.S. 
In 2022, she is taking a group to the once a decade Floridade International Horticulture Expo in the Netherlands. Now, that's something special to look forward to. To learn more, visit our website, waterwisegardener.com, and under the Garden Tours tab, you can sign up to be notified about upcoming tours. So what's next for Nan? She has a new online garden school. Yeah. This is her next venture in educating and growing gardeners because there is so much information available for gardening in other regions, but little of it applies here. Her goal is to help people understand where we garden, where they garden, and to empower them with information and skills that apply to our region so that they can become happy, successful gardeners. It is an ongoing membership system where she will, she will be sharing content every week, mostly online. Visit her website and sign up for her newsletter to stay in the loop with this and all that Nan does and offers. These are just some of Nan's many accomplishments and contributions to our community and to horticulture, all of which are why she is our well-deserved 2021 Horticulturist of the Year. I would like everyone <laughs> to applaud, even if you're muted, I think it's fabulous, fabulous. So let's bring Nan in. Let's see, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing. It's so, it's really, I'm so touched you guys. <laughs> I'm really honored. It's really fun to, to, um, to receive this award and to be recognized in this way. And, um, you know, I, it's true that a lot of my career is attributable to the connections and the people that I have associated with through the Hort Society. I, you know, we've talked about this a number of times when I started, when I joined Hort Society, which was not long after it was founded back in the 90s, I was the youngest person. And I was the youngest person for a long time. How the heck did I get to be on the other end? <laughs> it's like, how, how did that happen? How does that happen? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, it's, it's nice that that happens. And it's nice really to be able to give back, which is, you know, where I am right now, which is a lot of the motivation for garden school. You know, the knowledge is here and we all share bits and pieces of it. And I'll be doing, you know, interviews with experts and things like that. But, you know, if we don't turn around and um, pass that on to the next generations, it doesn't happen. And I would, I've been the lucky recipient of, you know, the knowledge and, and nurturing of people like uh, Jim and Barbara Hartung and various other people on this call, on the Zoom. You know, without people like that, I wouldn't know what I know. And it's my responsibility to keep that chain going. So, um, well, yes. you're doing a fantastic job of keeping the chain going and uh, so many of us just uh, enjoy every day San Diego Gardener Facebook group. I mean, it's just a, it's, it, it's a everyday part of our lives. And who would, who would have expected that? It's, it's you know? <laughs> so who would have expected that, but here we are. Here we are. Here. So um, if you're, if, oh, I want to show everybody the great Oh yeah, I actually yeah. did get an award, you guys, and I delivered it to her front door earlier this week because I couldn't hand it to her in person on Zoom. So it was a basket that included her award. And oh, there's the basket, and it had Felco pruners and a carrying case, an orchid in a pot, and now she's going to show you a Let's one see. of Can you see this? Bowl from Ray Brooks, so and this is a this is this is a um, turn bowl made of olive wood from Ray Brooks, whose whose bowls I've admired many times at meetings. And I've always wanted one. I'm just never managed to do it. Um, he inscribed it on the bottom. I don't know if you all can see that, or maybe you can see it backwards. It says. 2021 Horticulturist of the Year, Nan Sturman, with, with his name and the date and the fact that it's olive wood. 
Um, my husband and I have a collection of turned items because his brother is a turner. And so this would be great to add to that. But I got to tell you, this feels so nice. <laughs> this feels so nice. So Ray, really, yeah, that was it, the first thing I picked it up and went, oh my God, that's just like, I could sit here and just rub this all day. It <laughs> is award worthy. That bowl is, is an award all in itself. Uh, Nan also gets a lifetime membership to San Diego Horticultural Society. So she's now a lifetime member. She's in a select group of uh, horticultural old people, a select group of old people. people. No. <laughs> <laughs> Of wonderful people. <laughs> Karen, can I jump in? Yes. Just Nan, Nan, just so you know, and I apologize for not knowing her name, but that wood came from a tree in John Clement's fiance's backyard. Alicia. Okay. Alicia. Yeah. That's so great. I understand there's a, a link there between you guys. Yes. So that makes is. it a little extra special for you. It, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. I'm really touched. Oh, I'm going to tear up. Okay. Don't tear up until afterwards. Okay. You have a presentation to give. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. I think everyone's ready. Everybody, yeah. everybody is here for this. So take it away, Nan Sturman, Horticulturist of the Year 2021. Okay. Um, so let me just see, Ken, can I share my screen? Uh, let me check. I think you can, but let, let me double check. Yeah, I can. Yes, I you can. Like can. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and then, hold on. I'm going to go to here. And let's hope this works. Can everybody see that? Uh, you yeah, mostly people are on mute, but yes, it is definitely on. Okay, can you yeah. see the, the splash screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So hold on. You have to you have to get get out of there and then share your screen after you activate your slides. Otherwise, we can see all your slides. What can you see? Being full you screen view. After you started your slides, right? I mean, after you started sharing. Hold on, my my technical expert is is in here. What do well, you see? see your one slide. No, it's just the, it, it, you're, you're fine. You're, 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 it's your working. preview okay. is. Thank you. My, my, <laughs> so my husband's in the other room watching. <laughs> he just came uh, running in to say, no, no, you didn't do it right. But I did it right. I've been doing this for a while, too. <laughs> Looks right uh, to me. OK, good. All right. So let me just explain that when, um, when this all happened, and Karen said, you know, we'd like you to, to say something, you know, give a presentation. I thought, what, what am I going to share with you all? Um, and I decided, excuse me, that I want to show you a selection of the gardens that really inspire me. You know, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. So many of you have opened your doors to let me in and show me your gardens. I get to travel the world and see amazing gardens. And you know, I think that most of you are probably like me. When you when you see a garden, when you see some gardens, they just grab you. I mean, they, there's like this visceral re reaction and response. And that's what pulls me in. I, I mean, I get excited. My heart starts beating a little bit, a little bit faster. And this, it happens sometimes in the most unexpected places. But I've seen countless gardens like that, which is part of the joy of doing this work. And to show you all of them would take me a month. <laughs> so I just picked a selection and I wanna share some of those with you tonight. So consider this to be a sampling. It's no way comprehensive. And um, I, I just saw so that's what I'm gonna do. All right, now let's see, let me make sure I can get through the first one. There we go. Okay. Um, like I said, sometimes this happens in the most unexpected places. And there's a friend of mine, she might be on this call, I'm not sure, who lives in Carlsbad. And I go every so often to visit her garden, which is really impressive. Um, and, and every time- no, I'm sorry, I'm going to Sue, you got to mute yourself. you got to mute yourself. Um, and every time I go to her place, I drive past this garden which always catches my eye, but I'm always going from point A to point B. So I never stop 
to look at it. But I was there last week and when I went and when I was driving by, there was this aloe and I, I pulled over, you know, the uh, right, pulled over, hit the brakes hard and walked over and took out my iPhone, thank God for iPhones and started taking pictures. Now this I'm told is, uh, uh, according to one of my friends, this is a cross between an aloe ferox and an aloe speciosa. This has to be at least 60 years old because most of us in our gardens, if we planted one of these, which is what this person did, they planted one, look how many stalks there are. So this, is, this was the aloe that made me stop. And this is the garden where the aloe lives. This is in the hills above Carlsbad. Can you all see this? Mm. This is in the hills above Carlsbad. It's an old ranch style house, probably from the, what, 50s, 60s. And it's just amazing to me. It's on a corner. This is a, pan this is a panoramic shot, so it's a little distorted, but it's a corner and it does stick out a little bit into the street and it's up at the top of a, of a hill. So it's got an ocean view, but the view of the front yard I think is just spectacular. This is a homemade garden. And because it's so old, look at the size, the scale of the plants in this garden. If you look uh, on your right, that huge, that's a, a um, um, euphorbia engine, sorry, <laughs> I blanked for a second. That very tall one, let's see, can I get annotate, hold on. I wanna get the spotlight, I wanna make it red. And I should be able to, here. Can you see it here? Hold on. There we go. See that? Yeah. This is Euphorbia Engines. It's enormous. That's got to be close to 20 feet tall. These golden barrel cactus, uh, three feet across, four feet across each one. Here on the left, this is an aloe dichotoma. Now, two years ago, I led a tour to uh, South Africa. And one of the places we got to go was the ancient um, quiver tree forest. That's what they call these quiver trees because they would take the branches and hollow them out and they're just the perfect shape for a quiver for arrows. They call these quiver trees. We saw them, they were like a thousand years old and they were about, about 20 feet tall. This one isn't nearly so big, but you can tell by the girth of it that that's a pretty old aloe dichotoma. The, the, <laughs> the, thing, the other thing about this, um, is you know, realize that the last time that, at least in my knowledge, that, that succulents were this popular was the 1960s. And I'm sure that's when this was started. So they've really been in the ground for a long time. Okay. Hold on, for some reason this doesn't wanna go. There we go. The other thing that really struck me is, you know, this is a slope, this front slope and Look at how austere this is. Look at the stonework. Can you see right here? That stone has a lizard carved into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's like desert pavement. You know, when you go when you're in the desert and you see that that burnished surface that we call desert pavement, that's what this is. That's what this guy created. This branch here, by the way, this is an acatillo. You never see acatillos growing in San Diego. They're really hard to grow. I I figure. The only reason they're successful here is because of the reflected heat off the stone. And then just look at how the stonework is on this, in this uh, one, the image to the lower right. It reflects the brick in the house. It's not brick, but the colors pick up on it. It's just brilliantly done. Another image, another couple images. You know, when I plant a garden, I cram in everything because I want every plant I can get. And here, there's not so many plants. It's the interplay off the, it's the interplay between the plants and the, the hardscape. And it's just, it's, it's inspiring. Would I create this? No. Do I wish I could? Well, kind of, yeah. It would be fun to do something like this, something exactly the opposite of what I would do. But it gives me ideas for gardens that I design and for what I want to do in my own garden. So if, if anybody who lives in North County, you want to know where this is, ask me offline and I'll tell you. I never did meet the owner, by the way, or I haven't yet met the owner, but I sure took pictures. <laughs> this is a totally different garden. This is the garden that belongs to Betsy Klepsch. 
Now, if you're a Salvia lover like I am, you know Betsy because Sal Betsy wrote the book of Salvias. She's actually written two of them. Um, and this is, in this picture, which is about 10 years old, Betsy was 86. She lives in the hills above Woodside, California. So her husband, her late husband was a professor at Stanford and they built this house. This, as I remember the story, she told me they built this house many years ago and they finished it. And just as they were about to move in, he suddenly passed away. So she moved in by herself. And you can see that it's, it's very much country. Um, Betsy came to speak to the Hort Society, I don't know, well, probably a dozen years ago. And I got to profile her for the Union Tribune. And from that, we'd already been buddies online for a long time, but from that we became very good friends. So she then in invited me to speak at the Western Hort Society, which is their local Hort Society, and I got to stay with her. So I got to stay in her house and, and spend time with her in her garden. And when I woke up in the morning, whoops, this is what I saw out the bedroom window. This is a, a Western facing view of the grasslands, you know, the oak, the oak trees and the forest. And this is looking west and out here somewhere is Santa Cruz. And I was waiting for the fog to lift to see if I could see the ocean. I, I, it didn't, I, I never got a chance to really see the ocean, but I imagine that it should be right about where my pointer is. But that's what the native habitat looks like around there. Sometimes my, sometimes the advance works and sometimes it doesn't, there we go. So I got up early in the morning, the first morning I was there and went out with my camera. And this is the perimeter of Betsy's garden. Now there are deer everywhere here. So there's a double fence and the fence is, the deer can see it, the, my understanding is that it's close enough together that the deer know that if they made it over one fence, they wouldn't have enough running distance to make it over the second. So they don't even try. Unfortunately, I don't have that problem, but that's what, what, what uh, Betsy told me. So you can see on the outside of the fence, these are plants that the deer don't eat, but all of her salvia and all of her precious plants are on the inside. And that's what you can see down here on the right. I love this kind of garden. It's, it's rustic, it's personal, it's lush. There's a little bit of an English influence to it, but it, it has a California aesthetic. Here on the left, this is an old, old oak tree. Look how big that trunk is. And underneath it is the native strawberry. And then that this is our cyclamen. This is a cyclamen. Just a, just a touch of it, just a little spot of color. And don't you just wanna sit on that bench? It's just calling out for you to come and spend some time. On the right, this is some of Betsy's um, salvia collection, the pink flowered salvia is salvia involucrata, which has those big kind of balloon-like flowers. And she planted this, I think this is a cordyline. It could be a formium, but it could be a cordyline. They look very similar at this uh, angle, but look at the repetition of the colors. You've got the pink in here, the pink in there, and then just green everywhere else. It's, it's a garden where things are thought out, but it looks like they just happen to grow there. And that, I admire that. I really admire that. Just a few more details. This is a very rare Echeveria called Compton Carousel. I thought it was an Aeonium. And I took a little piece and brought it home. I, we did a remodel recently and I think I've lost it in the remodel. I think it, it died. But, you know, look at how she plays with texture and with color. There's not even much color in here, and yet there's enough variability that it's a beautiful scene. And on the right, this big clump with the lavender colored flowers is Salvia canariensis, the Canary Island sage. If you grow this here, well, I don't know about all of you, but I grow it and I can't stop growing it because it reseeds itself like crazy. So if anybody ever wants some, just ask me, I have a ton of it. But it, this is another example of just how she puts her, her compositions together. This here is a grass tree xantheria from um, New Zealand. So it's a combination of all kinds of things, but the, the textures, the colors, the structure, and the way she plays them off, it looks, like, it looks like it's a low maintenance garden. It's not. She has helpers, of course. By the way, I talked to a mutual friend yesterday and she's still kicking. She's at 96. Let's all hope our gardens keep us going that long.
Next, we head to the other part of the world. We're in South Africa. The last trip I took that I took people on was to South Africa. I've, I've had, um, I've been doing a series of tours to Mediterranean climate regions because I want to see all of those Mediterranean climate regions that are, you know, the, the five Mediterranean regions of which we are one where we, we don't get summer rainfall. So this was South Africa. I'd always wanted to go South Africa and we had an absolutely fantastic trip. Um, this picture is from Kirstenbosch, which is the famous botanic garden in Cape Town. These are the mountains that, that uh, back it and kind of envelope, envelop Cape Town. And especially the garden, the garden is built leading up to those mountains and there's trails that go up in the mountains, but we didn't unfortunately get a chance to do that. We spent most of a day there. We could have spent three, easy. Um, this is a garden of South African native plants. And what's amazing about that is that when we when you walk around this garden, there's so much that we know. So for example, let me just get to where I can see this image. On the left, what you're seeing is, hold on, excuse me for a second while I rearrange my desktop here. Look at bird of paradise, something we consider so common that many people I'm sure think that this is native to our, our region, but of course it's not, it's native to South Africa. Here's the the, um, the bird of paradise that we see in most gardens. And that giant bird is right here in this canyon. This, by the way, was a wonderful, wonderful walk between, um, you know, over across a gully that was planted with all kinds of interesting plants. Here's some details. Uh, if any of you grow restios like Chondropetalum tectorum, the Cape Rush, this is a restio. It's, I don't think that's Chondropetalum, but it's definitely one of the restios. This is a bulbiny. We have bulbinies in our garden we grow here. This here on the, on the right in this image is a, a leucodendron, one of the cone bushes. And then when you look on the image on the right, this is a protea growing against the background of Melianthus major, the honey bush. This trip was truly one of the most fantastic trips we've ever done. And we were in a big bus. We drove all over the Western part of, of uh, South Africa, the Western Cape. And um, the bus driver, the, the guide was a retired botanic garden director. He knew everything and he was wonderful. And the bus driver was fearless to the point where several times we thought, oh my God, this bus is gonna get stuck. But one day we were driving through a canyon along the road. Oh, and the other thing was the bus driver was very patient because about eight, 10, 12 times a day, I'd say, stop, because I'd see something out the window and I want to look at it. And, you know, that's what we're there for. And the, and the guide we had fortunately knew this area like the back of his hand. So no matter where we were, you know, if I'd say, what's that? He'd say, well, hold on, let's go look. And, and we'd stop and we'd literally get out the bus and we'd spend all of our time, you know, with our cameras like this. But one day we were going along in a, in a canyon, in the bottom of a canyon. And I looked out the window and it was a canyon where Melianthus major was growing on both sides of the canyon wild. It was just miles of this stuff in bloom like this. And it, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing to see that um, the, the extent of it and those purple, you know, burgundy flowers and all the, the pollinators that were humming and buzzing and trying to get in. Okay, so back in the garden, you can see these are, the, these are some of the pathways in the more tame part of the garden. Um, and on the right here, the, we timed it perfectly. Uh, this was October. The pin cushions were all in bloom. The proteas were all in bloom. All of, there were tons of bulbs in bloom. It was absolutely fantastic. A little more, you know, the osteospermum, the South African daisies. There's a field of them. This is where they come from. These back here, this is the, the chondropetalum I was talking about before, the Cape Rush. Hmm, my pointer is losing its, its color here. Let's see if I can get back over there. There we go. This is the Cape Rush. 
and then just one more picture. You know, you look at, I look at these things and I think, oh, I would never have thought to put those, the pin cushion with the cape brush, but I can do that in my garden and I can do that in my clients' gardens. Just another example of the plants that we have in our gardens that they have there. This is the giant um, cone bush, uh, Leucodendron argentia, the only, as far as I know, the only tree sized cone bush with more of that melianthus. And look at that background. Don't those hillsides look like they could be here? They look to me, they look like just like here. Of course, this big tree aloe, probably Marlothii. This is the, the leafless bird of paradise, uh, Strelitzia juncea, which to me is the most interesting one. Clivia, here's the clivia, something we see all the time in our gardens, clivia, but this is where they're from. And this is Delosperma, some of us call this ice plant. They call it, I'm not gonna pronounce this correctly. They call it something like phagy, phagy, it's spelled V-Y-G-I-E-S, and I think it's an Afrikaans term. So that's, seeing it there was just fantastic. And while we're in South Africa, I want to take you to see this garden. This is a garden that, hold on, I'm trying to get the spotlight back on. Um, this, so this is, this is, if you look at this photo, this is the, the uh, artifact of going on tours. All of your photos have people's behinds in them. You just can't avoid that. So this belongs to a guy named Yappy Esterhuisen. And when I was looking around for private gardens to visit when we were in South Africa, one of my contacts connected me up with Yappy. And um, Yappy was very happy to see us and very welcoming. And Yappy is a collector and breeder of bromeliads. So we were in Yappy's bromeliad heaven. This is the entry to his front door up on the upper left and on the right, is that Lindley? No, maybe that's not Lindley. But you can see that his whole, this is the swimming pool. This is not a big garden. It's a little house in a, in a subdivision with a little front yard and a little backyard. And every corner of it just about is filled with bromeliads. The way he displayed these was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The combinations um, the way he'd hung them on the palms, the way he integrated them with other plants. Every, every turn, there was something to see. These are all his Tillandsias, his um, air, air plants. And this was the first time I had seen air plants sitting in these little wire cones. He makes these himself. I've seen now other places, but they're really easy to make and they're brilliant. You just literally sit your air plant into the cone and it hangs from whatever you want to hang it from. And then while everyone was ooing and eyeing, Yappy took me by the arm and he pulled me into the back part where he had his breeding and propagation facility. So this is, you know, we're not the only people in the world who are crazy about plants. Here's Yappy's collection and what he does. And the other thing that was so funny, by the way, this is Yappy on the left and another detail from his garden. Um, so this, so Yappy lives kind of on a corner and his collection spills out into the neighbor on this side and the neighbor on that side and across the street. And as you drive through the neighborhood, you can see who he's friends with because those are the houses where there are bromeliads everywhere in the gardens. And by the way, this is, this is my travel look. This is, you know, camera around my neck, bag, scarf, ready for anything. And that's basically how we do it. With that in mind, now we're in Long Beach. Believe it or not, we're back home. This is Long Beach, California. This is a um, Dustin Gimbel's garden. Dustin is a brilliant landscape designer. I, I think that he is as brilliant as any of the famous, um, famous, he will one day be among the famous landscape designers. Um, this is a little bungalow that he bought a number of years ago. It is in a neighborhood that of course at some point had been lots and lots of bungalows, but now most of them have become apartment buildings. He's surrounded on two sides by apartment buildings and it's pretty dense. But so what he did was he started out by, if you can see it on the upper left, I don't know why the spotlight's not working for me, but um, 
he started out by planting himself into a, a green walled space. There we go. So he planted green, green uh, shrubs. These are ficus nudida. Just completely enclosed this small space with this big green wall. And then he took the small space and he subdivided it into smaller sub spaces. And each space has a different function. So again, this is one of those gardens where you walk through and every, every turn of your head, there's just things to see everywhere. His color combinations, I think, are fascinating. Gray, orange, black, purple, green. You don't see that very often. And as in South Africa, you know, here's his pin cushions, and then we have all the different succulents. This is on the left, you just get a hint of this acacia pendula, the, the weeping acacia. Um, and these stacks, so Dustin's a really great guy who has this imagination that doesn't end. He never sits still. I mean, literally, this guy never sits still. He's always creating. And so he makes these hypertufa balls and um, stacks them on rebar. He needed a divider in this, in this particular area. He wanted to divide sections of the garden, but he didn't want to use plants to do it. And he couldn't find anything that really fit his aesthetic. So he just counted some rebar in and made these hypertufa balls that are open on the top and bottom and started stacking them. And the color goes along with all the broken concrete and it just works in his garden. So I'm gonna show you a few more pictures of his garden. Here you can see the weeping acacia um, from a couple of different perspectives. This walkway here in the garden, you see the, the wood walkway, it looks kind of like a boardwalk. That's just leftover end cuts from some projects that he did. He just collected the wood and he brought it home and he laid it out diagonally across the front yard, which makes this small space seem much, much bigger because it's at a diagonal. Here you can see a little bit better on the left and on the right, you can see his plant combinations. You can see the, um, these um, dikea, which are wicked, wicked, wicked sharp, but look at the color. And then this is an Acamea blanchettiana, the orange bromeliads, along with the grays and there's those hypertufa stacks again. One more picture from his garden. This is his lawn. This is maybe oh, six feet across in both directions, maybe eight. But this is what he calls his lawn. And what that is, is a little tiny uh, creeping plant called Frankinia thymifolia. I've tried to grow this and I, I failed, but he's right near the beach. And so it's pretty humid. And see these faces? He buys stuff. I think this is his face, but he, make, he, he casts molds from all different things that he buys that he finds in, in secondhand stores and doll heads and all kinds of things. And he makes a mold and then he casts them in concrete and other materials. And then he just places them throughout the garden. I so wish I had that touch, but he does it brilliantly. Okay, the next garden, some of you know well, this is Patrick Anderson's garden. I don't know if Patrick is on this call or not, but this is my dear friend, Patrick, who I met at Hort Society many years ago. Patrick lives in Fallbrook. And um, Patrick's garden is fantastic. He has developed this garden himself over the years. He'll tell you that he's not a garden designer, but he is. He just does it for himself instead of for other people. His um, garden and also Dustin's garden are in my most recent book, Hot Color Dry Garden. And um, this is the front entry, which Patrick did a couple of years ago. But his imagination and his color choices and his texture and the way he uses plants is fantastic. This is just orange dyed concrete. There's orange dye in the concrete itself. But look at how he echoes the colors. This is a sedum called Nesba, I always trip over this, Nesbamoranian or something like that. It's in both, both places. He's got the rough rock texture and the smooth concrete texture. He's got this wonderful Pyloso Sirius cactus, which is bright blue. I wish I could grow that, my garden's too cold. The big round barrel cacti, the Pachypodium, and all the colors are echoed in all of his materials and all of his structures. There, I, there is never a day that I have gone to Patrick Garden and not had that oh my God, my heart's going pitter pat feeling. This was a, you know, one day that I was there probably two or three years ago taking photos. 
and look at the colors. This is not, I did not retouch the colors in this. This is how it looked. I just think it's fantastic. And would you be surprised that this is Patrick? And look at the colors in Patrick. <laughs> so this is Patrick actually, and the upper left, this is Patrick at Christenbosch with all those osteospermums. And this is Patrick with me and a group when we went to Santa Barbara, we were at this amazing pottery place called Eye of the Day. And this is Patrick. Do you notice anything about the colors he wears? In uh, the Netherlands for the first trip that we went to Floriata. And this is Patrick on safari with us in South Africa. But look at the colors he wears. He matches his garden. One of my absolute favorite plants in Patrick's gardens, and there's a lot that I love, is this eucalyptus. Now, for those of you who think that eucalyptus are nasty, horrible trees, there are some that are nasty, horrible trees, but there are some really fantastic eucs. This is a eucalyptus called uh, eucalyptus macrocarpa. It is a shrub eucalyptus, and um, it is the, one of the hardest plants to grow. At this point, when I took this photo, it was probably about five or six feet tall. These are the giant flowers with all of their stamens. For those of you who are in garden school with me, these are the male parts, these are the stamens. This is the flower, this is the flower bud, the capsule. So this is what, uh, when, the, when this opens up, this is the flower that you see. I have tried growing this plant three times. I'm on number three, I'm, I have a three strikes you're out rule. So if it doesn't work the third time in my garden, it's gone. But fortunately I'm on number three. I've had this, my plant for about four or five years and it's, it's nowhere near as big as Patrick's. It's really hard to grow. If you find one, I strongly urge you to try because it's really great. Let's see one more picture from Patrick's garden. This was before he'd went to Africa. This is before we'd gone on that trip, but he had the aesthetic. And you can see that a visit to his garden is just an absolute delight. Not irrigated, totally unirrigated. And I would say minimal maintenance considering how big it is, but it does, everything requires maintenance. Okay, our next garden is completely different. This is Renee Shepherd. If you use Renee Gar Renee's garden seeds, or if you heard Renee speak to Hort Society, this is Renee's garden. This is Renee in her garden. This is her home. She lives uh, in Felton, which is near Santa Cruz, in this beautiful ranch style home. And on the lower right, we see her front yard. But on the upper left, that's her and part of her, one of her test gardens on her property. Renee has, I think, about two acres. And she tests all of her seeds in her garden. It's not the only place she tests seeds. She has uh, test gardens. I think there's three or four of them around the country, but everything gets tested in her garden. Again, can you tell that color really does it for me? So Renee, um, this is a newer garden. She, her friend, and mine, but her really dear friend, Roz Creasy, who wrote the edible landscape books. Roz is the first person to write any edible landscape books. If you don't have the edible landscape book that Roz wrote in the early 80s, you should get it, and her subsequent books. Roz lives in Palo Alto area, and Roz designed this garden for Renee. And it is just all flowers all the time. Many of them, the varieties that she sells, but not all of them. And this is her on the lower, the photo uh, in the center, lower part of the center is the front yard and this is her outdoor dining area, but it's in the front, but she's on acres and it's like, nobody's gonna, front yard, backyard, doesn't matter um, where, where you sit, but it's, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous property and a gorgeous, um, a gorgeous garden. I wanna show you a couple more photos from this. There we go. So a bench placed where you would most wanna sit there's little character like sculptures and shapes. These are chickens here. And they're, they're just all kinds of crazy little statues and things all throughout the garden. This is a beautiful little gate that leads from the front yard to the back. Um, and this is the upper test garden. This is when I was there this particular time, she was testing, you can see tatsoi here and squashes there. This is her garden shed, not shabby, not too shabby. 
And this is the lower garden. This is where she was testing tomatoes. Notice how she spot, who supports her tomatoes. I'd never seen that before, but that's how she supports tomatoes. And then on the lower right, this is her standing in um, a test plot for pollinator plants. She has different mixes that she tests. And this was a pollinator seed mix. And uh, she's, Renee's focus is two things, edibles, for people to grow because she wants people to cook. So she's always focused on production and flavor, 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 flavor. And the other is she's a big lover of old fashioned flowers. So sweet peas is one of her specialties and these pollinator combinations, you can see there's native uh, carchia in there, there's cosmos, there's marigolds, all kinds of things. Those are what really get her excited. All right. Completely different now. We're in Solana Beach. This garden, some of you may have visited. This is the garden that belongs to Eric and Irina Gronborg. Again, long time Hort Society members. I met them through Hort Society. Uh, they live on a cul-de-sac in Solana Beach of homes built, I want to say in the late 70s or early 80s. Very, very, very conventional. And Eric and Arena are very, 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 very unconventional. They bought this house. Um, they didn't know anything about plants or gardens. They certainly didn't know about gardening here. And they started with nothing. They didn't have any money. Um, the house was, you know, the landscape was grass and asphalt. And they started by driving around the neighborhood on trash day and picking up, you know, cuttings of succulents and things that people put on the street. That was uh, 40 years ago, maybe, something like that, um, 30 years ago, probably more in the 30 years, years ago range. Uh, Irina told me at some point when I was there visiting, I don't remember if it was for our TV show or just another time, that she painted the garage blue to try to fit into the, the uh, community. That was her way of trying to fit in. Oh, 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 wait a second. Do you see this plant here? That's that eucalyptus macrocarpa that I showed you in Patrick's garden, and it's growing in their garden too. So over the years, Eric and Irina really took to this. And they joined the Cactus and Succulent Society and they were fruit growers. And so their plant collection started to expand. Now, Eric is a very, very famous ceramicist, world renowned ceramicist. And Irina is a botanical illustrator, equally well known. In fact, if you can, oh, you can't see behind me, but I've got, can you see me? Yes or no? Can you guys see me at the same time? I don't think so. But one of her, one of her uh, illustrations is behind me on the wall. You can see that when I stop talking, if you can't see me. Anyway, um, and so together, they, they've developed the aesthetic of this for this garden together. And you can see Eric's um, ceramic pieces and the, the way the plants are laid out and the sequence and what's in the garden is really a collaboration between the two of them. So this is, this by the way, on the lower right is a raised bed because the soil was so bad, they were worried that the plants wouldn't survive. So the, they, they put down this concrete curb and then they filled it with good soil and they put in the plants. And of course they couldn't leave a gray curb so they painted it red. And then these are, these are ceramic pyramids that Eric made. And then of course the, the pebbles. Uh, on the left is, is classic Eric ceramic. I just love that. I just love that. It, it just takes my breath away with an orchid in it. And on the right, these are more of his ceramics, but you can see the, the, the influence, Serena's influence in the colors and the plants and the way that all of this is put together. This is right next to their front door. More details, they collect bromeliads. And then on the right, see this little character here? So, as much as these things, uh, as Eric's pieces are aesthetic, they're also functional. This is a hose guide. There are, I don't know, 
a dozen, two dozen of these little characters sprinkled throughout, little heads sprinkled throughout the garden on the corners where every time they drag the hose, they would decapitate something. So Eric made these hose guides and this is one of them. They're all various shapes and sizes. Oh, and what do you do with a jacuzzi? You make it into a pond, of course. These are Eric's uh, handmade tiles. And the planting is um, lily pads and water hyacinth. And it's just, you know, though you've got the bamboo back here. This is not a low maintenance garden either. But it's a, and it's not a fussy garden. It's a very unfussy garden. Um, it feels rustic, but it feels very planned. It's definitely a human made environment and it's very, very welcoming and comfortable. Here's some more of his characters. Oh, down on the right, that's another one of his hose guides. So pieces just end up places and the plant, some of the plants plant themselves. You can see this is mother of bazillions that kalanchoe that just reproduces itself everywhere. And it reseeded itself and that's fine right there. Here's Arena on the right. This is, uh, well, on the, on the left, first of all, these are all bromeliads and that's the house behind it. And you can see in the corner, this is um, um, floss silk tree, um, Ciba, what, are they, what are we calling now, Ciba speciosa? They planted this from a seed and it's now, I don't know, three feet across. The aloes, the geraniums, you can see how the colors play off each other. And down here on the right, at some point, Arena decided she wanted more fruit trees. This is the back of their lot. It's a very narrow rectangular lot and there was a slope. And so she decided they, they needed a retaining wall. So they built this block retaining wall, but of course it couldn't just be a plain wall. It had to have embellishments. So it's got these, you know, these insets with these circles and these little um, decorative elements on the surface. And then of course they painted it China red right after they came home from a trip to China. Oops, I have a little boo-boo there. Okay, so there's one more garden that I really wanted to mention, that I, that I have to mention. This is Jim Bishop and Scott, Bo Scott Borden's garden in Mission Hills. I'm sure many of you have been there. It is truly Jim and Scott in my top five gardens, maybe the top two gardens in this region, but to do it justice would have taken me an hour. And Jim posts a ton of photos that are far better than mine on Facebook. So I'm just gonna whet your appetite and say that Jim, I hope when the quarantine is over and Scott, you're gonna open up your garden for the members of the Hort Society and encourage everyone to go. Because I think I've probably talked pretty much long enough. And uh, I, just wanna, I just wanna entice you to go see their garden because it is spectacular actually. And we, we, we featured it on A Growing Passion too on our episode on container gardens, I think. So with that, I want to invite you all to come and travel with us, see, go around the world and, and see more of these wonderful inspiring gardens. Right now, well, we were supposed to go to Australia last year that we didn't make that. But we're definitely going to the Floriata, which is that once a decade World's Fair of Horticulture in the Netherlands in 2022. And we'll go to, I don't know, maybe we'll go to Northern France, maybe we'll go to Germany. We'll, we'll spend about 10 days in that part of the world just traveling around and uh, it's, it'll be wonderful. These are photos from last time. If you haven't seen my show, A Growing Passion, you can find it online or on KPBS, growingpassion.com or on Facebook too. And here's all the places you can find me. And with that, I am going to say thank you for letting me take so much of your time. Oh, this is fabulous. What a wonderful presentation. I've saved the chat, which I will send you because people have said uh, just wonderful things uh, and I want you to be able to read them. Uh, one of the questions was about the eucalyptus in Patrick Anderson's garden and- um, Eucalyptus macrocarpa, yes. Yes, and uh, I think Jim Bishop uh, said he killed it in the chat. <laughs> 
Yeah. How so, many, wait, Jimmy, if you've only killed it once, you get two more tries. Oh, I had four in one oh. gallon in, from two inch pots and I killed all four. I got them up to one gallon and then they all died. <laughs> they you know, cannot take any summer water. I mean, you can't even look at, you can't even cry on them and they die. I didn't know that. Well, I knew that, but I, I couldn't not water. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you where I have mine that's six, cause I killed, I killed several. I have a horse trough in my front yard, which is west facing and it's metal. So it heats up incredibly in the summer. It is in that horse trough with no irrigation. And that is the only place where I have had success growing it. So if that tells you anything, you're right. No summer water, no summer water. But it's, if you see it available, buy it and try it. There was one of all places in the parking lot of the hotel behind my house. And I stumbled over it when I was back there complaining about some issues with the hotel. And I was like, what is this doing here? And they cut it to the ground and killed it. <laughs> I could have died. I went back later and it was gone. I was going to take seeds. <laughs> anyway. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All right, Karen, any other questions that you want well, to Well, I, I personally would like to know, do you have a favorite plant? I'm, I know it's a hard thing. <laughs> Does anybody ever ask you if you have favorite children? How well, do you answer well, that? Well, I don't have kids, so no. But <laughs> they asked me about the pets, and I, yeah, I have a favorite, so I'm not the one to ask that question of. I know it's hard, but... but it, what day is it? Where am I standing? Whose garden okay. am I in? But it, today, at your house, do you have a favorite? Um, the the aloe rubra violacea is blooming right now. It's at the end of its bloom. It's one of my absolute favorite plants. Oh, see, uh, I love that answer. Uh, my neighbor across the street, Heather, who I think is on this on this Zoom, has a fantastic garden. And a lot of the plants that we have, um, we both have. And so when the red hot poker Nyphophia Christmas cheer blooms, and it's blooming now, it blooms on her side of the street and my side of the street. And it's like a big beacon. And it's just, the orange and the yellow is gorgeous. Um, uh, OK. You know, I, it, what day is it? Yes. Okay. On this day, it was an aloe violacea, what you said? Ru rubro violacea. Rubro violacea. I'm making yeah. a note. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, <laughs> are you showing me that? <laughs> Kurt, Kurt just walked in. Let's see. Can, you, can you see this? Can you all see this? Kurt? Yeah. He, all right, so this is the the um, knife of the red hot poker I was talking about. He just came walking it's in with his like phone. Glowing. He said he shot this photo yesterday. It's glowing. So that's yeah. what we're talking about. <laughs> Thank you, dear. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's very funny because he's in the other room and I'm in here. We're doing the same thing. <laughs> we uh, just the congratulations are just flowing like hot cakes oh. over here in the chat. So, um, so I'm going to be just funneling that your way. You're going to love to read it and 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 all. But it, what a fabulous, inspiring presentation and just proof positive that you are the horticulturist of the year this year. Well, I, I thank you. I hope that that you guys found us inspiring. Thank Absolutely. God we have a passion for plants, right? Yes. Yes. Every time at these meetings, somebody says hort people are the best people, plant people are the best people. And I think we really have uh, feel that when we get together, it links us in a way that other things don't. So absolutely. I, let me just one more comment. I know that Jim and Barbara Hartung were on this on this this Zoom and Jim and Barbara, I wanted to include your garden too. And I just ran out of space because their garden is it's really a special garden and they are very special people. They, I know that the more than just these gardens inspire you, including the heart tongue. So there's a possibility that you could uh, follow this up with more gardens that inspire you in the future. Anytime, anytime, just ask me. And by then I'll have 10 different, I'll have 10, I'll have 20. And this was honestly the hardest part about doing this, about making this presentation was winnowing it down. Sure. Uh, my list was, well, anyway, it was very, that was the hard part. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the tour that's coming up in 2022 and your school. So, and I, I'm hopeful that everyone's going to go sign up on your website after this to get the newsletter alerts when that, that goes uh, live. So maybe we'll be traveling together again someday, people. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> I, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to that, really. I, oh. Thank God I have photos. You know, because and, yeah. and and we have Zoom. We have Zoom. We who can... would have ever imagined? No. <laughs> no. Who would have ever imagined the role that Zoom would play in our lives? Yeah, and it's going to stay that way. We're pretty convinced as a board that even when we can get back together again for live meetings, that Zoom will always be with us from now on. And we will Zoom live meetings because uh, that's just the way of the world. And, and that way we can stay connected with more people and spread the word to uh, everyone in a better way. And so it's, it's really changed us for the better in that sense. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, All right, so everyone. We have uh, we've come to the end of the evening, and it was a grand evening. It, and we're so grateful that you're here. If you aren't a member of the San Diego Horticultural Society and you'd like to be one, just head over to our website and click the join or renew button and that'll uh, give you the, all the information that you need. And we look forward to having you join us uh, and become a part and be with us every month as we go and learn um, from people like Nan and about just every aspect of gardening in our beautiful part of the world. <laughs>